Okay, good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, my challenge to try and um, inspire and energize you all after the afternoon keynote and afternoon tea and before drinks and the conference dinner. So um, I'll be looking out into the audience. If there are any drooping eyelids, we'll we'll have people on to you. Um, I'm um, grateful to uh, the ANU Development Policy Centre uh, for support today, for uh, convening this session from, from Lachlan, Pip and Alyssa. Um, and we're here to talk about Asian donors, China, India and Korea. My name's Michael Wilson. I'm the group CEO of a company called eWater Limited. We work um, both in Australia and across the world on any number of water resource management um, challenges, uh, including development challenges, uh, particularly in South Asia, Southeast Asia and the Pacific. And eWater manages on behalf of DFAT uh, a range of programs. The flagship though is the Australian Water Partnership, um, which uh, works across uh, multiple countries in the Indo-Pacific, including um, all of the countries that our speakers today will have um, worked on. Uh, and my um, my history before joining eWater, I spent 15 years in both AusAid and DFAT. My last posting in DFAT was, uh, was in Vietnam, looking after the uh, Mekong development programs um, for four years. And then my last job in Canberra was running a branch in the um, development policy division called Governance, Fragility and Water. And the only thing I still do is water. So here we are, here we are. Um, so um, uh, without further ado, uh, I'd like to introduce our first speaker uh, uh, to present her most recent research, um, and uh, Dr. Jane No is with us online. Um, she is a research fellow with the Australian Catholic University with research interests spanning human rights, migrant activism, global, global health and advocacy, and addressing family violence. She holds a PhD in international development from the University of Queensland, uh, a master's in social development from the University of Sussex. And today she'll be discussing with us her concept of coloniality uh, in conventional aid policy and delivery with the Republic of Korea as a case study uh, and using this as an opportunity to ask ourselves whether decoloniality uh, as a lens is, is a good way to strip away some of our preconceptions and see development challenges um, uh, in parts of the world we're interested in, but, but through the eyes of emerging donors in a different way. So I'll hand over to jae -un. Thank you for your kind uh, introduction, Michael. Uh, thank you and good to see you everyone. I'm joining from Brisbane. Uh, the Zagara people's land. Uh, so give me a sec, I will put up my slide first. Okay, yeah. <laughs> uh, so today's work is a very early stage of my work, so it's work in progress. So I welcome uh, any comments to develop further this idea. So I will talk about coloniality. Uh, there is a growing literature on colonialism and decolonizing in humanities and social science. And in this presentation, I prefer use the term coloniality rather than colonialism, because I'd like to highlight the long standing of uh, the patterns of power that emerged uh, as a result of colonialism, but it's still perpetuated inequality, particularly in power and knowledge. And of course, we talk a lot about decoloniality as well. So it's a reverse process. So we question the coloniality uh, and the assumptions uh, underlying that coloniality, like there has been some assumptions about the linkage between the modernity and you know the colonial history or development, whatever. And uh, of course, in development studies, uh, the colonial legacy and development has been 
a lot discussed. And some very critically see aid as a form of coloniz colonization. And, you know, like the modernity or economic growth were often rooted in some Western thought or approaches to development. So that's why many scholars have noted some related concepts like savior complex or white supremacy. And uh, these studies suggest the need for epistemic and material decolonization. Uh, however, for example, in Quetari's recent book, uh, we need to be very careful because this critical view can be easily co-opted, like as we have seen in many radical or some critical uh, development uh, thinking, like gender or human rights. So in today's presentation, I'd like to focus on the Korean aid because, uh, I don't know, in, in Korea, coloniality or colonialism is rarely discussed because we don't think it is relevant to Korea. Actually, Korea was colonized by Japan. So the Korean uh, aid agencies have claimed that we are different from the conventional Western donors. Actually, we share uh, some common history of being colonized and experiencing extreme poverty like other lower income countries. So uh, when I read the aid documents, uh, actually Korea uh, self position as an uh, empathetic donor differently from other Western donors. So actually for this study, I couldn't collect data separately so that I would go back uh, uh, to my previous publications, uh, which were on Korean aid and development sector. So some studies looked at the policy documents or NGO documents, and it also includes some interviews with uh, the development personnel. Just when I looked back these uh, publications and the data that I had, uh, I try to apply the lens of coloniality. And particularly, I'd like to give some focus on the knowledge production process. Uh, so the coloniality knowledge, uh, but I mean, uh, uh, I'd like to look at who generate which knowledge and for what purpose, and whose knowledge are considered more legitimate or valued. So, so firstly, um, Korea, <laughs> I, 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 I named it as a follower. So Korea has tried to catch up some Western donor models. Uh, as you, you may heard, you know, in 1960s and 70s, Korea has pursued its uh, economic growth rapidly. So we call it like a market-driven developmental state. And in that the uh, foreign aid from some donors, particularly the USA or Japan, yeah, it played a big role uh, in enhancing the economic growth. So we had that kind of model of development and economic growth. But uh, when Korea graduated from um, receiving uh, receiving aid, Korea started to grow the volume in aid. And it was, I don't know, at the time I was working as a uh, as an angel worker and it was early 2000s and there were not uh, any universe, any Korean university which provides development related courses. So at that time, many young people started to go abroad to study development related courses. And now they came back to Korea and they are working at aid agencies, governmental agencies and NGOs. Uh, there is no 
no research on that impact of that, but anyway, they have brought that knowledge uh, uh, from mostly from the UK or Netherlands. And another big uh big point for Korea is you know, Korea became a dark member in 2010. And since then it uh, excelled adopting some strategies and guidelines uh, to be aligned with the so-called international norms or standards established by the existing dark members. So when I looked at the policy documents and guidelines on gender and human rights, Actually, it has every language and tools that other donors are using, but there is a big gap in the policy level and the implementation level. It can be about the, the capacity of the partners, but uh, more importantly, I think the domestic discourse on gender and human rights are not quite, uh, yeah, they, they are quite behind the, so-called global norms. So the, actually the, uh, there was no internalization process or you know, contextualization process. So some civil society organizations uh, criticized that the governmental agencies are just picking up uh, the, the norms or values in a very selective way as just accessories. And the second role Korea has claimed is Korean development model as a knowledge contributor. Uh, generally, Korea has claimed its position as a, a bridge between high income countries and low income countries. And in terms of knowledge production, uh, it claimed to play a role as a middleman uh, by translating global norms and values into locally implemented programs. And they have institutionalized that idea into programs like knowledge sharing program and development experience exchange program. And one very typical example is Semal Undong, New Village Movement. Uh, now it has repackaged it as a rural development model. And despite lots of criticisms around it, but still some government-led agencies are pursuing that model. Uh, and with some like one size fits all connotation. So, so that also invites lots of criticism from civil society organizations, because this Korean model based on their own development experience uh, is on evidence and problematic because as all of you know, the there is a huge difference in economic or political context between Korea and other countries. So when I submitted abstract, firstly, I uh, I understood this Korean model as a like, uh, to avoid, it's an, a, a Korean attempt to avoid just uh, catching up Western model. But uh, when I looked at deeper, it just looks like just imposing like Korea labeled knowledge uh, to other countries through funding or aid projects. And definitely, each, uh, the knowledge product production process involves uh, local actors. And Korea has claimed its role as a middleman or knowledge broker. But when I examined some policy documents and media articles, uh, they, are, they, are, uh, they are describing, actually they are reproducing the knowledge about people in low-income countries in a very a uh, homogenizing or dehumanizing way. Because in their stories, uh, in many cases, they are described as just helpless or just they are waiting for help, something like that. So actually, Korea has a very short history of doing development. So 
basically we need to listen uh, to local people to learn about the local context. But uh, the uh, the the documents or you know the interview uh, data shows actually the meaningful participation is often lost in that process. And when it comes to uh, knowledge production, uh, labor division occurs. Uh, what I mean by this is, um, you know, uh, Korean researchers or Korean uh, leadership people, they design like evaluation program or research projects. And on, uh, very often the role of local staff members are confined to just data collection. So, so it's just, it also shows that there is no uh, meaningful participation of local personnel in the in producing the knowledge about the local context. And another thing uh, I'd like to discuss is the influence of Christianity in Korean development sector. So basically, it's not about governmental sector, but uh, uh, I think you, you would be familiar with some literature on the connection between Christianity and coloniality. And Korea also shows that one. And particularly after the Korean War, uh, we, Korea had a huge support from the early Christian missionaries. So the missionaries established schools, hospitals, and vocational centers, and the institutions still remain as a very important uh, key, key ones in Korea. And uh, part of that explains why uh, Korean development NGOs, they are very rooted in that history. Because like World Vision, it started from the Korean, or Korean War and it started doing some helping the orphans and widows, and now it became the one of the biggest uh, aid and development NGO. And all three biggest Korean NGOs are associated with Christianity. And we have uh, like more than 200 NGOs, and half of them are categorized as faith based organizations, and most of them have a Christian background. And why does it matter? Because these organizations prefer hiring staff members uh, from the same faith. And uh, in low-income countries, uh, we don't, Korea didn't have such a human resource pool in low-income countries. So, Many of them, and particularly the smaller organizations, they started working with missionaries there. And that decides how they target uh, the people to work with and how they engage with the local communities. So that influence is quite huge in Korean NGOs. And from the, NG uh, from the interview data that I had, uh, that also indicates some influence of the uh, faith, particularly the Christianity. Because as, as you can guess, many, many Korean NGOs are Christian NGOs, so staff members, they also uh, have faith. But it also has a positive impact. It can be, uh, it can decide their motivate. It can be their motivation or commitment or resilience uh, throughout the journey. But the some interview data uh, indicates they have got that idea like, uh, I am in a superior position, so I'm there to uh, help people. It's a kind of sacrifice that Jesus showed us, like as expressed as incarnation. So it means Jesus was made flesh. So sometimes they, uh, they, um, they conceptualize their development work as a part of a calling or mission, something like that. 
about two minutes to go, Jaehyun. Okay. Uh, so actually that picture uh, was from the trip that I had two weeks ago in Ghana that clearly shows the connection between colonialism and religion and development. And at that, when I was in Ghana, I could really feel that, you know, it is a contemporary issue. It's not about the old history. So my concluding remarks is, uh, Korea is not free from colonial sentiment or practices. So definitely we need to have more stronger reflection. I think it's the biggest capacity that we need. So we need to look at our language use and the mentalities. So decolonizing step should be the starting point of decolonizing practice. And decolonizing practice, I think it should involve silencing and desilencing. So silencing uh, myself. So sometimes we think we are the expert, but no, we need to shut up and need to listen to them and we need to get their voice heard. That's the desilencing part. But most importantly, it should be beyond the rhetoric. It's, it's tricky and, and difficult. So that's why many scholars um, uh, noted that maybe, you know, the decolonial, decolonizing practice is important for development studies, but in a way, it also can be recentering us, you know? So, we need to be careful of that and and such big you know some uh, some critical thinking uh can just happen without any fundamental shift and we need to be also mindful of that as well <laughs> okay that's it uh from me today thank you very much Thank you very much, Shayun. Um, and uh, if, if there are burning questions um, coming to your mind, we will have about half an hour for questions uh, of the panel once we have um, heard from all three of them. And just a reminder, Jayun has published several papers for COICA, the, the Korean International Cooperation Agency, um, but uh, clearly is, um, is, is challenging some of the precepts as well, which is, uh, which is always healthy in our business. So next, I would like to introduce Hannah McNichol. Uh, she is a PhD candidate in international development jointly between the University of Melbourne and the University of Manchester. She's a Cookson scholar for her PhD studies. Her um, research interests uh, include US-China competition in development, climate change and special economic zones, labor and work and uh, worker protection and innovative and blended development financing and impact investment. Got a particular issue in, a particular interest in, in development issues in Cambodia. Um, she holds a master's in international development from the University of Melbourne, uh, an honours degree from the University of Oxford. And today will be talking to us about challenging unidirectional theories of development cooperation via um, the complementary policy framework that she will explain to us is provided through uh, a convergence of the Belt and Road Initiative um, and the Sustainable Development Goals. Hannah, can I get you to come up to the lectern, please? Hey, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Hello, my name is Hannah. Um, thank you for, first off, just thank you for your interest in our panel. I do realise it's 3.54, which is a time when it can be hard to concentrate. We're all thinking about a coffee. Um, obviously, thank you to my panellists. It's always great to learn from fellow people in the field. And of course, thank you to our chair. But the biggest thank you, I think we can all agree, is to our organisers, because this conference is humongous. You know, I'm blown away with how many attendees there are. So, yes, thanks very much. Um, and just FYI, I've got my notes on this one, but then this is the clicker. So if they get out of sync, 
that's probably going to happen. Um, okay, so yes, we're at this panel. Um, as I mentioned, my name is Hannah. I'm a joint PhD candidate between the University of Melbourne, University of Manchester. At the University of Manchester, I'm affiliated with the Global Development Institute. Uh, a bit of context about me, my research. I'm a member of the extremely contentiously named Second Cold War Observatory, uh, which is a research lab of global scholars who look at US-China relations. It's led by one of my supervisors. Uh, they, most of the people in the lab look at US-China relations often to do with global economy, political economy. Um, I'm kind of the token development studies person in the group and often say, what about gender mainstreaming? What about <laughs> this? Uh, they focus a lot more on infrastructure and economics. Um, effectively, the conditions of my doctoral scholarship were Belt and Road, Special Economic Zones, Asia, um, China, pretty huge. Um, so I spent a long time thinking about what's interesting about those, where does that fit into the literature. Effectively, now my doctoral research looks at how special economic zones are being reframed as a policy to achieve a wide and diverse range of SDGs um, in addition to their traditional economic objectives in both discrete Chinese policy initiatives, uh, let's say dominant development initiatives, you know, World Bank, UNIDO, um, UN bodies, World Economic Forum, and co-produced policy initiatives between the two. And if anyone here knows anything about special economic zones, you'll know that's quite a weird policy shift. You don't tend to think about special economic zones as associated with SDG 5, you know, gender, SDG 1, no poverty. That's actually not the focus of this presentation. Instead, the most relevant part of that for this presentation is the idea of the co-produced initiatives, the idea of these two different development models working together. So in particular, my research in this presentation is I look at how are the Chinese and development, Chinese and dominant post-1945 dominant development model, and I'm just going to say dominant model now because it's a mouthful and I can't get my mouth around that. Um, how are they actually working together in the contemporary global development ecosystem? How are they interacting and how is that different to the main framework we're normally operating in, both in policy making, the media and academia, which is divergence and competition? Clicker. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> oh, I think that we're good. Thank you. Oh, uh, and just FYI, this is the first paper of my doctoral research and it's an analytical review. That means it's not using the data that I just recently collected in Cambodia. Instead, it's reviewing the current literature. I make conclusions about what's out there, where we need to go and why that's important. Uh, so the title is Complementary Convergence. The case of the Belt and Road Initiative and Sustainable Development Goals Integration, which henceforth is BRI SDG integration. Another mouthful, but you know, development studies people, we love an acronym. So introduction. So China, China's aid and development model, including its institutions, norms, modalities, actors, underpinning economic model, has always traditionally been understood as divergent or different to the dominant model. Chinese development actors have also positioned it as different. How is it different? I'm sure you guys all know lots, but from the 1960s, which was the first emergence of China's aid and development program, uh, they advocated for an anti-imperialist model that rebuffed foreign influence, particularly Western influence. In the 1980s and 1990s, they rejected the Washington Consensus of 1989, which is effectively the blueprint of the liberal um, economic policy prescriptions that has since defined the financial mechanisms that development operates in. Uh, today, oh, sorry, instead they focus on a much more state-led infrastructure focused export orientated development model. Today, China provides more market loan rates and export credits in opposition to liberal concessional lending. China prov promotes non-interference over non-conditionality. And very importantly, China's rise emerges as part of South-South Development Cooperation or the rise of the South, which is a group of formal, formerly recipients who have now moved to donors as their economies have matured. China, uh, Brazil, Chile, India, Turkey, there's a big list of them. And they have been consistently positioned as a challenge to the dominant model. So introduction still, despite um, this main framework of divergence of competition, some scholars have actually started looking at, is there also convergence? 
with the dominant model, not just divergence. Uh, more recently, some scholars have started exploring a phenomenon known as BRI SDG integration. So the BRI is China's state. Ooh, no, sorry. <laughs> the BRI is China's state-sponsored overseas infrastructure development program. Probably heard of it. The SDGs are the 17 goals, 169 targets, 100, 243 indicators for sustainable development uh, that underpin the UN 2030 agenda. In BRI SDG integration, the BRI adopts the SDG framework for global recognition and environmental and social governance and uh, guidance. And the SDG financing gap and infrastructure gap can be achieved via BRI policies and economic resources. Uh, it's important to note that these scholars who are looking at this phenomenon, I haven't just made this up, they are responding to uh, initiatives, some policies, reports. If you look up BRI SD integration, there's a lot of interesting stuff out there. There's even a little um, body that popped up in the UN called UNDESA, which is specifically to bring these two initiatives together. Um, it's also popped up in Chinese development institutes also, sorry, KTEC and SIPCO. Um, so immediately, BRI SDG integration, it sits uncomfortably within this big agenda, uh, sorry, uh, framework of divergence of competition that we read about. My paper names this complementary convergence, and I believe it precipitates in a series of new questions for development scholarship. First, is a deliberate process of complementary convergence between the Chinese and dominant development model possible? And how can it be conceptualized? Second, what challenge does complementary convergence pose to dominant narratives surrounding China and the liberal or dominant development establishment? So to answer these questions, my approach is I bring this BRI SDG integration scholarship into dialogue with social sciences convergence theory. So that's actually thinking, what does convergence actually mean in the academic literature thus far? Have people already explored it? They have. So then I'm looking at how convergence by these BRI SD integration scholars, what does it mean to the current, current convergence um, scholarship? Through applying this framework, I will make three key points in this presentation and the paper. First, BRI SDG integration scholars do conceptualize a novel and dynamic process of convergence that's both North-South and South-North. However, I also argue that a dominant Eurocentric conceptualization of North-South convergence is still underpinning analysis. And it's always a focus on China must be moving towards us. Yes, they're adopting um, dominant liberal norms and modalities. Third, it is only when a more dynamic understanding of convergence that rejects Eurocentricity is applied to analysis that it becomes clear that there may also be processes of South-North convergence at play or the dominant model picking up on stuff that the Chinese model does. Okay, so let's get into it. So what does convergence actually mean in the literature? So in the social sciences, convergence is understood as a long-term process whereby societies move towards a position of similarity in structures, systems, and processes, most likely as similar levels of economic development are achieved. Very importantly, Dominant understandings of convergence denote a process normally whereby liberal states move towards liberal states as their economies mature. And because of this unidirectional framing, traditional convergence theory has been criticised for determinism and Eurocentrism. But don't mind that, despite that happening in the 1990s and 1980s with the demise of state socialism, globalisation, rise of neoliberalism, traditional convergence theory totally came back into fashion, and a lot of people thought, great, no, there's no hope for the other types of models, economic models. The liberal model has, you know, come out trumping. Uh, so this isn't a surprise for development scholars who have always thought that development has been underpinned by a very Western-centric chronopolitical landscape that determines that we all go in one direction. And at the same time, uh, 1990s, early 2000s, interconnected processes such as sinological orientalism, which is another mouthful, or the belief that China is now in a halting process of becoming like us or the USA or the West uh, was also solidified. Uh, so here we've got these examples. You've got the South, China's on that side, North on this side. Typically, we think of them not touching, they're divergent, they don't have much to do with one another. 
But under the conditions of conditions of, sorry, neoliberalism, globalization, there is this hopeful thought that, okay, don't worry, they'll come like um, the South and Chinese development model will end up coming like us as their economic model um, liberalizes and at, particularly as they integrate with the global market. However, over the past two decades, the rise of the South has consistently disrupted the North-South axis and dominant convergence theory. For Maudsley, who is my favourite uh, scholar, by the way, if you want to look her up, um, the fracturing of the hegemonic development regime can be understood through a tripartite framework that examines material ontological and ideational shifts. Indeed, as at 2023, China's now the second largest economy behind the United States by GDP per capita, according to the IMF, and a lot of low-income countries are increasingly looking to China and their development model and saying, hey, what did you guys do differently? So two things. This means that we've already had a bit of a challenge to figure two. Doesn't mean they're not moving this way, supposedly. And it's very much so reinforcing figure one that we are operating in a divergent uh, framework. Uh, however, Still, while, while still very much so working in this wider framework of divergence, as I've mentioned, scholars have started considering if there is convergence between the two models. So it is clear that the, the rise of the South hasn't signified a uniform challenge to the global North. For example, trilateral aid cooperation is often stated as an example whereby Southern states and traditional donors at times are working together in trilateral aid and that might suggest more dynamic processes of north-south, south-north convergence. It has also been argued that there is growing analogous ideological convergence between the south and north around the use of development finance to support national geoeconomic interests, resource extraction, and investor profits. Uh, effectively, this means both models are centering private capital and resources, which isn't a surprise. That's where this sector is going under the conditions of the financialization of development. It's important to notice in this example of analogous uh, convergence, this is not due to them actively interacting in the global marketplace on the ground. It's due to the fact that they are both subject to analogous global trends, or they're both responding to wider market trends. There's also convergence via socialization. Uh, so you've got Riley, Esteban, and Olivier. They also explore, unlike analogous convergence, Convergence by socialization theorizes that Chinese development actors might adopt liberal or dominant uh, modalities and norms on the ground as the interactions increase. That's where we've got figure four. One thing you might notice is though that the framing of that little area of scholarship is typically, will China adopt dominant uh, modalities and norms? It's never the other way. We've also got convergence via two-way socialization. So the scholar who kicked this off was Chin in 2012, who argues that the increasing relationship between China and the World Bank has not merely resulted in China's internalization of dominant norms, but also signifies a two-way process of socialization as the World Bank concurrently adapts to the rise of China. You've also got McNally and Gruen who look at that, which is a great paper. There's also been increasing research into China's adoption of mainstream global development agendas, such as the SDGs in relationship to Beijing's Global Development Initiative. Uh, you've got Janice and Tang who evaluate how China adopting the SDGs might be leveraged by policy entrepreneurs. Cheng and Louis recently examined how Western development studies courses are popping up in Chinese universities. Of course, the debate as if to such developments are a genuine commitment to sustainable development or they're more so about global image building has materialized. And next we have more recently BRI SDG integration as a possible convergence has also appeared in the literature. As noted, the BRI is China's state sponsored infrastructure development program. The SDGs are the goals that underpin the UN 2030 agenda. In BRI SDG integration, the BRI adopts the SDGs for global recognition, environmental and social guidance, and the SDG financing and infrastructure gap could be achieved via BRI policies and economic resources. Scholars analyzing this phenomenon argue that the BRI and SDGs uh, overlapping goals, governance approaches, strategies, and the BRI is uniquely positioned to achieve SDG 8 and 9, which both focus on infrastructure. 
So moving into part three, where I bring this scholars analysis into dialogue with social sciences convergence theory, immediately we can see that BRI SD integration scholars do conceptualize a novel framework of uh, convergence, which is both north-south and south-north. It's also deliberate. They're brought together to produce a complementary framework. It's not inadvertently that they happen to be working on the same project. However, oops, yes. However, despite complementary convergence being novel, it's also clear that the BRI STD integration scholarship is still understood as a process of north-south or China moving towards the dominant. This is clear because the emphasis consists consistently on the fact that China needs to improve its practice, ESG, green investments, CSR, and of course, with a lot of issues along the BRI consistently noted, that makes sense. It's also the BRI that probably has the most capacity to change, seeing it's the one with the projects and the resources, whereas the SDGs is a framework. However, on the, other, on the flip side, the SDGs aren't, uh, aren't analysed really at all. They're instead assumed as a fixed position, despite the fact that there is plenty of re uh, research to show that the SDGs have their own issues. So I'm going a little bit fast now. Um, most importantly, though, is that it's clear that when this BRI STD integration scholarship is framed in this traditional convergence theory framework, that you miss often the other examples of South-North convergence happening. For example, one of the main uh, opportunities that the BRI STD integration offers in the literature is that it can, it can contribute to the global infrastructure gap. And despite highlighting the imperative role of China's expertise in this yeah. process, analysis omits the fact that it's that very expertise, state-led, export-led uh, and infrastructure financing expertise that has been traditionally thought of as the divergent model that is going to be leveraged to achieve the SDG financing gap. Um, I'm going to go quickly. There's also a big focus on China's state-led uh, financing mechanisms that also doesn't get mentioned too much. So here we have effectively, whilst uh, the process of convergence may well be complementary, it's important to realize it actually might not be equal. Indeed, if the UN is advocating for development strategies traditionally anchored in the Chinese development model, then there's also significant processes of north-south convergence at play. In this context, two new important questions emerge. Are the SDGs about process or outcome? And do the SDGs change if they are achieved by what are once considered divergent development strategies? I'm on the conclusion, don't worry. <laughs> Ultimately, BRI SDG integration suggests more diverse and cultural alternatives to homogenizing constructs of development as progress. It also underscores the need for a much more dynamic theorization of development convergence in our current contemporary global political economy of development. Moving forward, the proposed notion of complementary convergence should also be valuable beyond BRI SD integration as a case study. In a very recent paper, Jepson argued that rather than simply forcing China to adopt OECD and Paris Club norms, the development finance structures of the US centered and Chinese systems could be integrated. Why not take the best parts of both? Finally, scholars may also seek to understand what BRI SDG integration or Chinese dominant complementary convergence looks like in practice, on the ground, or how it's negotiated in different political economies. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it warms the heart of an old constructivist like me to hear people talking about uh, or warning about single paths of travel um, and um, and faulty uh, faulty cognitive frames. So um, congratulations, Hannah. Uh, all power to you. And uh, Hannah's actually in her spare time also the communications and research lead at the Australian International Development Network. So um, a busy woman um, and and going places. I think you'll agree. Um, now, uh, the third um, presenter this afternoon, Sumitra Nepani. Um, he's executive director and a policy researcher at Policy Entrepreneurs Incorporated based in Kathmandu, Nepal. Um, he got here on Sunday, so he's 
got over is he's he's been running the whole time yeah. um since arriving so he's run run 300 miles around canberra already since uh, since sunday uh his research interests uh span water energy infrastructure agricultural sector reform and improved decision making for sustainability um and uh he has an interest in china as a development partner partner especially through the belt and road initiative um, in um, in South Asia in particular. He holds a Master of Philosophy in Public Administration from Tribhavan University and a Master of Arts in Sustainable Development Practice from Terry University, New Delhi. And today he will take us on a journey through the history of education diplomacy by China and India in South Asia how they pursue foreign policy goals, drive prosperity and build influence compared to the approaches of traditional um, Western donors, uh, with a focus on the experience in Bangladesh, Nepal and Sri Lanka. And, um, and Sumitra's research has, uh, has included sponsorship by the Asia Foundation. Sumitra, over to you. Um, with all the thank yous that Anna has done, I second that. Uh, not wasting time. It's really difficult to go last. Um, you need to craft a story and communicate what you want to do, but just not be boring. Um, I hope uh, that is what I end up doing. Um, just to give some context around uh, the topic uh, of research. So everybody talks about geopolitics. The reason that you all are here today is because you find this area of work interesting. Um, I don't need to repeat what Hannah has said, is that the emergence of China has made this more interesting. Um, IR fraternity has found its purpose, security fraternity has found its purpose. Um, there are narratives, as you mentioned, dominant narratives, but what does it look like for South Asians who are in the midst of a multipolar world? For Nepal, Arguably, the multipolarity plays out uh, to the fact that we have two neighbors uh, that are really emerging. One has emerged, other is in the process of emerging and is going to be probably very dominant. So what we are trying to do uh, at Policy Entrepreneurs Inc. is, is think about uh, a recipient perspective to these dominant narratives. As we started engaging and we kind of um, found this idea of of geopolitics to be more interesting and interfacing with some of our work on energy infrastructure. Um, we, we kind of looked around what was being discussed and we really didn't find a recipient voice to, to the narratives around uh, uh, how countries were operating, how China was operating, what the region was doing like. It felt like as if uh, I had in front of me a uh, hundred different cocktails that I didn't know, all looking very exciting, colorful, um, and, and narratives around some cocktails being having poison and uh, some cocktails not being good for my health. Not all, not every, but not all cocktails are, but still, uh, what we are trying to do is really deconstruct what's going in those cocktails and for us to understand how we can leverage this uh, geopolitics as an opportunity moving forward. There are threats, how do we recognize threats? and then leverage the opportunities that the geopolitical competition is uh, bringing in. Um, we, we've been studying uh, the region through various lenses, including infrastructure and economic diplomacy. And this particular research uh, is a collaboration with Asia Foundation, as Michael mentioned. And this is really understanding the softer side of how um, that is being played out, uh, the soft power diplomacy. And we've used education as a means of study. So, the scope of my conversation is going to be kind of limited uh, to this. Uh, this is a co-authored paper between uh, myself, Nijin Rai, and Anurag Acharya. I really want to say a big thank you to Anthea, who's been really central, uh, and the Asia Foundation office in Kathmandu, who's been really part of this thinking process uh, and engaging with local institutions and research institutions like us in this process. All right. Um, Soft power dates back as, as back as uh, statecraft and politics, right? Uh, just that the term itself was coined around 1990s uh, by Joseph Nye, but uh, the practice has been there for, for centuries. Uh, and the modern states have been, this has been a widely used practice. While we focused this paper on education, uh, there, are, there are several other soft power tools that 
uh, are employed by states. Uh, this include art, music, culture, food, cinema, sports, uh, you name it, Hollywood, Bollywood in India, cricket, everything. Um, so the, the scope is really wide. And the idea of, of soft power, uh, including that of education, is how do you wield influence without coercion? As, as states are projecting themselves to be powerful, st staging in a global arena, you can't just use diplomacy in the form of coercion to really kind of stand out. You have to promote a value that is wider than um, what your military strength is or what the amount of ammunition or influence you can draw from ammunition. So you need to project yourselves as, as being this uh, agent of change. This is, this is something that has really cultivated uh, the foreign aid discourse also, which is, some may argue this is part of soft power, but um, it, I, I let you decide if that is soft power in itself. But for me, I think even that element of foreign aid uh, stems from uh, soft power. Education in itself is a win-win strategy uh, for soft power. One, it's it really, the narrative is around strengthening capacity of recipient countries, um, and it allows influencing without coercion. But mind you, it is also big business. Uh, the education industry at current is estimated to be around 250 billion US dollars globally, right? Uh, so international students, they, they, it's a big composite of how that economy is shaped. If I don't mind saying, even in Australia, it's, it's a big industry here also, right? So foreign students coming in, they're part of that larger industry and economic engine contributing towards uh, economic growth. And it is expected to grow um, as the day move forward. Um, just a case in South Asia, I've, I've, I've touched on this uh, slightly. So there is, there is a recalibration of uh, politics and power in the region. So the region has been traditionally, uh, India has been the hegemonic interest um, it's been dominating and it's invested quite significantly through different means, infrastructure or, or extension of soft power to maintain its interest. But there is a level of distrust that other South, South Asian nations have with India. Um, and then the rise of China and stepping it, uh, China stepping into Indian sphere of influence has India a little bit anxious and is trying to respond. It's having to respond in its own sphere of influence around China. And, and what it makes it more difficult for India is that the Western allies um, kind of bank on India to respond China in the region, right? It's not just India responding for its sake, but it is also responding to the interest of its Western allies um, in the Cape. Um, so soft power has been really central to staging of both India and China. So China who's hosting the Olympics, um, they've used pandas for their diplomacies. Uh, if you've heard of panda diplomacy, it's become really famous. Um, and including India, I mean, this is uh, the rise of Modi, if you see, and then uh, how he's projected himself to become a leader of India, a nation that is aspiring to grow big. And that global staging has really required India to put forward ideas and notions that, that rise above uh, the, the general aspirations of the country. Um, they are somewhat different, which I will uh, touch upon next. In terms of uh, actual uh, uh, education diplomacy and how that rolls out, in India, they started very early. From 1950s onward, they've started this practice of education diplomacy. Um, they inherited some legacy from the British. Uh, on really credible institutions. And you saw Nehru kind of take this forward, create institutions like ICCR, Colombo Plan, ITEC, this is the uh, Indian Cultural Center, the Indian Technical and Economic Cooperation that does a lot of trainings and scholarships. But that is kind of now really shifted that, that idea of education has moved from uh, providing scholarships on engineering and medicine to how in the recent times there is this larger civilizational framing to India's policies around education diplomacy. So you see things like yoga, uh, something that's been really popularized by Modi, 
um, uh, really central to, to that education. If you go and look at the number of scholarships that India today hands out, um, there is this Ministry of IU scholarship that's homeopathy, yoga. So there's this cultural and civilizational uh, undertone to, to that framing of education diplomacy. In comparison, China is, is a new entrant. Um, it, it had some early start, but really it picked up uh, when Deng Xiaoping came into power in 1978. And this movement of really thinking about structural reforms in, in China's education system really took shape. Between 70, 78 to 2015, you had around 4 million Chinese students going out to study abroad. And 20%, around 20% of uh, the 4 million were funded by the Chinese government. So it was not about attracting students, but sending students outside. What it essentially was trying to communicate was the need for a reform uh, to support uh, the economic growth processes um, in, in China. Um, so it's kind of benefited with the stage of growth benefits uh, through education, uh, stage of economic growth benefits, and it's pursued policies, really, really interesting policies, um, including the Project 211, Project 985, double first class initiatives. And all of these are talking about China taking steps to really transform their education system from ground up. So from like uh, elementary schools to middle schools, to universities and, and higher degree courses. Um, so in that sense, our study was basically to understand what was happening in the region. We didn't, it's not meant to be pitting China against India. That's not what we want to do. That is not the objective of the study. Uh, we just want to understand this better so that we know what's happening uh, in the region. And Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, because uh, the three are recipient countries in the region. So there are some aspirational formulations that are quite similar across the three countries. And uh, we've taken scholarships, short-term trainings, uh, and all of those uh, parts that uh, comprise uh, at the scope of the study. Um, so what are the critical observations on India's education diplomacy? Um, they, they have clearly spelled out notions of neighborhood being the first, and it is still first. Uh, if you look at the number of scholarships that India hands out annually, uh, most of them are targeted to the region. So you have X number of scholarships for Afghanistan, you have X number of scholarships for Nepal, for Bangladesh, for Sri Lanka, for Maldives, across different sectors. It's very specified. Um, but you can also observe that uh, the number of scholarships are then expanding to other parts of the region, and they kind of also mirror the policy shifts that the Indian government is taking in its foreign policy and looking beyond the region, right? So. Um, a uh, number of scholarships to Africa and Southeast Asia. Um, South Asians still comprise half of all international students in India, and a lot of them are actually uh, from Nepal. If you have to look at what attracts students, um, so these are all based out of surveys we've done uh, in the three countries, uh, language and cultural convenience. Uh, believe it or not, every, every South Asian is, uh, has watched a Hindi movie and then though they've not gone to India, uh, Bollywood has helped them kind of speak that language. And there is some cultural affiliation uh, uh, between the countries in South Asia. Uh, Nepal is connected, but even people in Sri Lanka would, would understand the cultural notions uh, of South Asia. Um, there is this element of reputation of uh, Indian institutions, especially in engineering and medicine. And there is a lot of preference even still in South Asia today where people opt for uh, medicine and engineering courses in India. Um, and then the price of these degrees are, are really something that uh, motivates students. Um, and there is now with the Indian economy growing and the fact that there is that cultural convenience, uh, people are also looking for post-study employment opportunities. Um, the critical observations on, on the Chinese part uh, is, is that People, uh, China, what China has done to prioritize higher education through the different initiatives that it has taken is really something that is that is moved a league apart uh, from, from India. So the number of universities that uh, the China has kind of developed, uh, the quality of education that it is really focused is attracting a lot of uh, foreign students. 
Um, in fact, China is around, I think, third currently uh, in, in, the, in terms of attracting number of foreign students annually. Um, what attracts students to, to China uh, is connecting with China's current and future prospects uh, around economic growth. So whatever, whatever is uh, the narrative uh, in the West and other parts of the region, the South Asian context still favorably views China. Uh, and, and the economy therein. So there is a lot of cohesion in, in how people think about growth opportunities and being part uh, with China. Um, uh, quality education and specialization. So this is something that really stemmed out. So if you would want to study something around uh, a biotechnology engineering degree, so there is that level of specificity that is available um, in the Chinese education system today. In fact, uh, China is the number one country that produces the most number of engineers globally, right? So every year, I think there is a number, I, I don't have, I don't know it off my head, but it's, it's the ranks first in terms of engineering graduates every year. So there is a high level of specificity in, in its education curriculum. Um, and they've invested quite significantly in bridging the language barrier. I think um, I, I will touch upon this. So this whole uh, the establishment of Confucius Institutes uh, and Confucius language centers, a lot of people are talking about it, uh, some good, some bad, but uh, that's been a practice that really has bridged that gap. Um, okay, uh, major observations. Um, so if you have to look at what China and India are doing, the posturing is, is very diff different uh, across the two nations, but the political endeavor are kind of motivated by by similar motives, right? They just want to project themselves, soft power project, and then uh, make that influence uh, moving forward. But different posturing, but motives are same. Um, there is undoubtedly a very strong perception around politicization uh, and opportunities being transactional rewards uh, for uh, elites in, in the local economies. For example, if you can talk around all of these South Asian nations, so you'll hear that not everybody has equal access. The embassies play a big part in how the uh, scholarships are granted. So a politician's uh, son or a nephew or a daughter might get enrollment to a really reputed uh, engineering college or a medical college, and there is some exchange of favor and all of that. And that's the case for, for China as well. So there is that high degree of uh, perception around politicization. Um, if you have to really look at numbers, then you could say that there is a gradual shift going on. Um, so there is a growing preference for China, as simple as China provides better stipends than India, right? Uh, as a student, that matters a lot, among other things. So it could be as, as simple as that, but generally the perception is around going to a new place, studying an advanced degree in a new system, connecting with the economic opportunities therein. Um, so, and that is kind of, as I said, uh, backed by this recognition on quality of Chinese institutions. The shift actually is, if you're to unpack, unpack that shift, um, so uh, China kind of receives almost a double number of South Asian uh, applicants uh, to, to its programs. If you're to take about Pakistan, which is around 50%, right, very natural that you have a lot of students from Pakistan, they have uh, a BRI scholarships plentiful uh, going around Pakistan. Uh, but yeah, um, the numbers are quite similar. Um, not the best representation, but I was talking about the quality of institutions uh, and, and the progress um, made by two countries. If you were to just rank the top tier universities in India and China, and this simple QS world ranking of universities speaks a lot. Uh, of, of these advancements. It is not the absolute measure, but it gives you a good picture of the advancements that uh, China has made to improve quality education because uh, its universities are better ranked, they put in a lot of money, and that, that effort to really transform the education sector has, has paid off. Um, versus Western diplomacy, uh, education diplomacy, uh, there is striking resemblance in approaches versus the West. Uh, in fact, what, what China has learned and India has learned is what was initiated by West. 
So even uh, Indian consuls, uh, the, the Confucius centers really resemble the Gothes and the British consuls and the American centers and the whatnot that, that have been initiated to promote culture and uh, ideas of the West. Um, in comparison to the West, the perceptions, the West perceptions are less political. So you would, uh, a lot of students thought that um, uh, there is more structured and organized process that goes into selection and award of scholarships uh, than the West. Um, and I think the most in interesting element that came out of the service and the uh, uh, communications and the conversations was that still, while there was a growing preference for China, students thought both China and India to be a merely a stepping stone to, to going to the West. So it was like a corridor where uh, they just used uh, India and China as a stepping stone to move up to the West to pursue degrees and and this is kind of motivated by the fact that uh, I think the West has better uh, labor laws uh, and has more relaxed uh, policies around welcoming students uh, and integrating them into the society. Uh, a lot is happening in Australia, US, Canada. So people eventually want to move out. And this is just a stepping stone. I'm on my last slide, sorry. Um, so yeah, um, just to conclude, China, a late entrant, but fairly successful. Uh, there's continuing preference for degrees uh, in India, but the attra attraction is waning. Um, uh, Indian strategy really needs to step up uh, in the sense that they can't. So you see they're, they're promoting this idea that's on education that's very civilizational, yoga and stuff. Uh, that sounds nice uh, for a post training to the West, but if you had to look at as uh, from from a South Asian perspective, you would really want advanced engineering degrees, robotics, and all of these that India is kind of missing out. Um, so increasing competition uh, in soft power, especially in education, is only going to benefit recipient countries like Nepal, Bangladesh, and Sri Lanka, which have comparatively less advanced education systems, uh, and people still need to go outside. Um, so as a recipient. What I would like to conclude is by saying that donor countries will always advance their interest um, in, in diplomacy, be it through soft power or whatever means, uh, but we must, as recipient countries, have the knowledge and the capacity to understand what's happening and use that to safeguard our own interests um, in this complicated and turbulent geopolitical times. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sumitra. And can I suggest uh, another round of applause uh, for all three of our presenters today? Thank you. Excellent. We have microphones coming. Um, so we have some time for questions. Um, I'm going to take moderator's prerogative and ask the first one of all the panel members. Um, so, uh, your research has, in different ways, in different sectors, uh, looked at the um, practices, I guess, of what we call the um, the newer development partners, uh, particularly in our part of the world, China, India, and Republic of Korea. If you were a policy advisor to any of these development agencies in any of these three countries, and you were to give one piece of advice about something that they were doing with all good intentions, but was tending to, to piss off the development partner that they're trying to work with, what would it be? Um, let's start with Jayun, if, if you're there. What, what are you gonna tell Koika um, about, um, about their practices you think they really need to know and focus on? Uh, thank you for the question, Michael. Uh, maybe as I uh, noted some gap in policy and practice, uh, you know, I today I talked about the knowledge production right? So the Korean agencies have a strong motivation to seek their, you know, building their own model like mm -hmm. other, you know, two presenter shoes in uh, case of China and India. Uh, but 
uh, I'd rather suggest COICA or other governmental agencies. Uh, we don't need to repeat uh, the mistakes of other donors did. As a late comer, we have advantage uh, to, uh, to learn from their mistake. So rather than just uh, adopting uh, established ones and uh, developing our own model based on that, maybe we'd rather go back to the basics. Like, so what we need to uh, look back, what is the ultimate goal of aid and development? It's not about just a national brand. So actually doing better uh, and working better with the local people, maybe we can build a different model. We can imagine different things. And as they as they as the COICA's policy documents emphasize their uh, strength as an empathetic donor, just rather than focusing on the history, we can look forward uh the future to build together with our partners. Yeah. Thank <laughs> yeah. you, Jay. Thank you, Jay. And and of course we know Korea is trying very hard. They have a development skills college um just outside uh Seoul, which um if you get the opportunity to visit, it's it's quite a facility. It's quite something. Um I sometimes wondered whether if we had something like that in Australia, we uh we wouldn't have um development skills uh gaps that, that sometimes we suffer from. Hannah, what's your great big piece of advice? This is on, yes. Um, well, reflecting on my notion that I put forward, complementary convergence, and your question was, what piece of advice would you give to these emergent development partners? But on the flip side, it's also um, who they are working with. Um, I think for me, the key word is pragmatism. We are in a situation where... The world is literally on fire with climate change. Poverty levels were rising for the first time. I know the data's a bit off, but, um, you know, during COVID, the issues are just so obvious. And for, you know, in academia, we are at risk of talking about the issues a lot. But as soon as, you know, you are there in the face of kids who don't have access to education, people who live in rural communities where there's no hospitals, um, this pragmatism, I think, needs to be at the centre of both China's development policy cooperation and also whoever it is, as I've said, they are complementing and working with. I think there is a unique opportunity for China to be working with MDBs because, as we all know, states are hesitant to work with competitors such as China. There is that geosecurity interest is less of an issue for MDBs than it is for, say, Australia. So that's why trilateral aid cooperation isn't happening as much. But trilateral aid cooperation, where it is the, um, say, the low-income country, China and an MDB, I think there is so much potential there. And China can bring with it its ex expertise, state-led infrastructure, export-orientated uh, construction and finance, which they are experts in. On the flip side, MDBs can bring their expertise, which has long been uh, being you know, curated and refined for a long time, whether that is monitoring and evaluation, whether that is gender mainstreaming, these two together could produce something that we need that is urgent, in fact. Yep, and and, and we've got the perfect opportunity in that um, Australia is a member of um, the Major Infrastructure Investment Bank. Um, so um, that should that should provide a bit of a, a bit of a canvas. Yeah, Sumitra, your advice. Yeah, um, I think the new donors um, in many ways are emulating what the West has done and the allies have done. Um, one thing they don't do is they're less transparent and less engaging. Um, I, I think in that sense, my advice would for them would be to be more transparent if you're projecting yourself to become um, donors for the future and long-term partners. Be transparent, engage with a wider audience, be appreciative of the diverse voices Unfortunately, what's happening, especially the regional example, and I think uh, this could resonate across different countries, is the new donors have really understood the political economy of decision making. And for them, it is just a matter of going, identifying decision points 
and making their way to decision points through channels uh, that include uh, the private sector or um, uh, brokers, um, uh, middlemen, whosoever it may be. And then they don't see that need and that imperative to really kind of build and engage in a process that is strengthening uh, processes internally, working with civil society and other larger institutions, which may in the future really are institutions that will determine and support the credibility of whatever support is coming into the country. Thanks. Thanks, Sumitra. Right, we have um, we have some time for some questions. So I will do it one by one to begin with, and then we'll see how we go. If you wouldn't mind introducing yourself, and um, if your question is directed to a particular panel member, um, please make that clear, or if it's to the whole panel, um, make that clear as well. Yes, over here. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name's Aaron from DFAT. Uh, my question is about education diplomacy. Um, thanks very much for your presentation, um, all of you. Um, so you mentioned about the analogy of a cocktail, which is a great uh, analogy for an Australian audience, uh, an international audience. We all know cocktails. Um, and maybe there are different bases in the cocktails, maybe some are whiskey or vodka or gin and so forth. And you mentioned China, China and India. What can Australia learn from your research about kind of what elements of that cocktail are attractive for people from South Asia or more broadly international students? Um, you also mentioned about the familiar familiarity for South Asian students with India. Uh, maybe Australia is not so familiar for some countries. Do you think Australia needs to work on that as well as part of that mix in that cocktail? Thanks. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, just a short answer. I think that's a very important um, question in the sense that uh, you would want to look at learnings. Sometimes they won't be learnings for, for uh, different sets of individuals. But here, the learning I think that DFAT especially can take away is this whole idea of uh, how students in South Asia see education opportunities uh, and then relocation and how that really adds up to relocation opportunities, right? For example, um, uh, while if you were to just look at India and China, then maybe there is growing preference for China to go and study there. But really, people really want to move out of the region as a whole. Uh, and this is backed up by the immigration numbers we are seeing. Uh, seeing. If you were to look at the number of students and people coming to Australia itself, right, that's there's a big South Asian composite. People are wanting to move. Um, that diaspora movement is going to, it's backed by education. You have to understand that, right? Or the means is education. So how do you go on unpacking this movement of diaspora? Um, and then how that is going to shape preferences of diaspora moving forward uh, in how DFAT probably wants to engage um, in other parts of the region. I think that is the biggest takeaway. It might not be as clear as um, uh, how you can shape your education institutions and benefit from it. Uh, I think part of it is already, the ball is already rolling. But really understanding how the diaspora movement that is moved through education is going to have preferences for tomorrow, uh, that I would say is the biggest takeaway. Thanks. Yes, here in the middle, Hi, uh, Grace Stanhope from the Lowy Institute. Um, my research focuses on non-traditional development partners in Southeast Asia, so this has been amazing. Um, I feel like the only big donor we haven't spoken about is Japan, and I was wondering, can I get the panelists' reflections on, is Japan sort of, I mean, obviously they're a fairly advanced donor, they've been in the DAC forever, they're doing quite traditional aid. Are they a model for other emerging Asian donors, or are they looked at as something not to emulate? What do you think? I might I might ask maybe Jayun to um, kick off on that if if that's okay. Uh, yeah, frankly speaking, I don't know much about <laughs> Japanese aid. Uh, but it's true. Uh, as for Korea, when it started to build its aid program, Japan was one of the model, uh, to follow. But uh. You know, Japanese aid is also um, how can I say that? It is foc it's foc focus is given to the infrastructure. Uh, in the beginning, and I think Korea tries to find some, 
uh, its own strength, like IT or you know some technology thing or education, vocational training, something like that. But still, uh, as far as now, the Japan and uh, Korea, the particular the development sector works quite closely among the scholars and and uh, at the agency level as well. Yeah, but sorry, but I don't think I'm in the position to answer your question on JICA or Japanese aid. <laughs> sorry about that. I mean, uh, speaking from, um, from, from my experience working in the Mekong starting about 15 years ago, um, uh, Korea, Korea, I think worked quite hard not to as an emerging donor and a new DAC member not not to be quite like Japan, um, to be uh, more adoptive of uh, lessons learned and um, I, I suppose shared best practice uh, and to uh, be seen to be communicating across um, uh, across the developed country donors uh, in a different way to to the way Japan did that. Just a just an observation, Hannah. Would you like to have a have a go at this? Uh, yeah, sure. So this is um, rather anecdotal, rather than uh, my fo research doesn't focus on Japan, but I've just had um, amazing experience this year. Six months of data collection in Cambodia for my research, and as I mentioned, I focus mainly on special economic zones. So I was. Uh, in particular, interviewing a lot of um, Khmer or Cambodian economists um, and policymakers who work in economics and special economic zones. And uh, Japan's presence in Cambodia did come up quite a lot. And there were kind of two most salient points was that, first off, the Japanese um, aid and development or often infrastructure financing in Cambodia um, is a lot more quiet it doesn't have a big show and dance about it. And that is, I've heard quite the style of um, Japanese uh, aid and development. But second, a lot of Kamai economists said to me that they quite see Japanese aid and development as kind of almost associated with the dominant model now, that it is also tied down with a lot of bureaucracy, a lot of red tape, and actually on a few infrastructure financing projects, Khmer economists advised to go with China instead because there was a lot less red tape. And, you know, we, that leads itself to other issues, but, you know, um, that's, yeah. We looked at Japan from an infrastructure sense. That is the other lens we're trying to understand uh, South Asia. And what we see is that people don't talk about Japan that much. Uh, though they are the biggest partners in infrastructure in South Asia, but they really there's hush hush around what's happening with Japanese aid, right? Well, almost benign. The perception is is of them being benign, um, but the if you start unraveling what goes into their operations on how aid is structured, then there are some really interesting questions you come across with, starting with cost um, and questions around. Why is there always a Japanese contractor that that wins and awards or on this high price uh, contract, right? Right or wrong, you can decide for yourself, but these are some questions that some other donors uh, are having to respond every day, whereas Japan does not have to respond to this. They go under the radar. It almost, their aid structure almost looks like a, a train in the sense that all of them is very compartmentalized into different boogies. So if one doesn't move, the other doesn't move. Right, so it's kind of staged in in, in that fashion. Thanks. Uh, so, when I went out to Vietnam to work on the Mekong, um, the then Director General of OzAid tasked me with founding some joint programming with Japan, the Republic of Korea, and China. Um, I was able to do it with both China and the Republic of Korea, but I couldn't do it with Japan. We couldn't get a joint programming relationship up and running, and that's why I didn't get promoted. Another question? Yes, over here in the centre. Thanks. Um, I'm Afshin Gasmi with uh, Palladium. A uh, question around um, indebtedness, and given sort of, sort of where we are globally today, I mean, we are sort of fast approaching potentially another... Uh, debt forgiveness scenario for a lot of countries, um, you know, um, be it in Africa or South Asia. Um, and without this, uh, or, or this sort of 
belief of competition between sort of the new donors and traditional donors, how are we going to bridge that gap, um, especially with a lack of transparency around certain types of lending, right? So if you look at how the Chinese are lending, it's not sort of typically directly government to government lending, it's through companies. So you're not actually able to know how much is owed to the Chinese. And when it comes to debt forgiveness, you need all the donors sitting at the table agreeing to the debt forgiveness. So I don't know what you're seeing sort of in that area um, when it comes to sort of donors working together or how the, the newer donors are thinking about this. Hannah, I, I wonder whether Hannah might start off and have a stab. Go on. Yes, I think a major issue with our current understanding of Chinese aid and development is the lack of transparency over debt financing and structures because we've got huge gaps in data. A big reason why we've got a huge gap, sorry, huge gaps in that data is because we define aid and development in a very different way to China. As you said, they focus a lot more on commercial and export driven development. So that doesn't get counted as aid and development. Um, in the data. So those gaps are going to take a long time to um, to rectify and for us to actually be able to do uh, legitimate cross comparisons. Um, hmm. is, that, is that helpful? I don't... Yeah. Uh, Jayun, do uh, you want to have a go at this? No? Okay. So there is good good debt and bad debt. Um, and some countries sometimes will have to carry bad debt. I'm saying this in reference to uh, how countries might have to formulate strategies. So when you have to make good use of an opportunity that is arising with geopolitical competition, opportunity has risks as well, right? And this needs to be weighed uh, within countries. For example, um, if if today in Nepal you want to build uh, infrastructure, for example, hydropower project, and you take money from the Chinese, it's not going to fly. You have to be really strategic in the sense that you want to sell power to India, and then they have a provision around how they won't allow any investment that uh, a project that has Chinese investments to sell power to India. But then again, there might be some infrastructure projects that might really help uh, the government of Nepal to beat around the system. For example. Things that don't quote me on this is um, that require more environmental and social compliance, right? It's easy to say that you need a really strong compliance measure when for every project, but we are at a stage of development process that sometimes we have to put corners. So just carrying that good debt, bad debt in that sense. Also, there is this notion that all debt sometimes is good. For example, Nepal, uh, Nepal has taken, I think the biggest debt is with World Bank, is with the multilaterals. And the perception is that that is good debt, regardless of whatever that amount of debt is. So it depends on how you see things, how you actually use that as an offer. Can, can I, I can I add one thing? Very quickly, because I want one more question. Okay, just quickly. Um... Within research, it's a lot, there's an increasing focus on kind of flipping the narrative that there is a one um, one big project coming from Beijing and that the Belt and Road financing and construction, that no matter where it lands or what political economy it lands or what um, nation or um, that it's going to land in the same way. But now that research is being flipped and the way that the Belt and Road financing manifests or lands in that country is so determined by the regulatory and business and legal environment of that country. So pragmatically, I would say the best way for us to keep uh, better tabs and understand the debt in each country is actually, if as development practitioners, pragmatically it would be to work with countries who are taking Belt and Road financing, and I know we're avoiding saying build their capacity, but working in public financing mechanisms and building that capacity to be able to take debt in a more sustainable way and have those transparent. And when that strength is built up, it means that when China offers loans, they'll say, yep, sure, but we need it in X, Y, Z. And they're ready to take it in that way. All right, last 30 second question and a, 
a minute answer, otherwise I'll get in trouble. Thank you, me too. <laughs> Yelena Park Development Pathways, probably the question for uh, Sumitra. Um, if uh, you look at Indian China's um, sort of democratic and less democratic uh, donor countries, um, and it looks like in terms of soft power, uh, China is sort of winning. And uh, what lesson or a tip uh, maybe democracy can take from that most successful soft power influence? Thank you. There isn't an easy answer to this because education is just one form of soft power, right? Uh, so you can't really talk about the democracy at large or the country at large of how one means of soft power has been exercised. So if you were to pick up another means of soft power, then India could be doing great other means of soft power, right? When we looked at education, it looked like China was doing better. If you if you take a different lens, then you would find probably a different lens. Um, what is more important is we start understanding and cultivating these different ideas and lens in research to understand what's happening. That is more important. I haven't answered your question, but that is all I can uh, contribute to that at the moment. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you for ensuring a, a very energetic uh, discussion in the last um, session of the day before the conference dinner. I'm very impressed and and quite proud of all of you. Um, so once again, um, could I thank uh, Dr. Jayan No? Hannah McNichol and Sumitra Nopane for their time today. And, um, and thanks again for the excellent support from Lachlan, from Pip, and from Alyssa from ANU. Thanks very much. Enjoy the rest of the conference and enjoy the dinner. Yes. Thank you.